Today, I want to teach you about using games to help children socially and emotionally. In Texas, we recently went through a really cold spell. A lot of the country did, but in Texas, we're just not set up for that. So as the state froze, we didn't have enough power to accommodate the surge in demand for more electricity. And so then the utility company had to have rolling blackouts, plus there were just power failures. And so really what that meant for our family was that for about eight days, we huddled in our house with usually not having any heat. And it was just a really unusual kind of pioneer experience for us. And on about day four, I noticed that one of the members of our family was super grumpy. He was just irritable. And I, I didn't know what his problem was. Uh, but then it occurred to me that maybe he was just feeling anxious. And so that night, my husband and I circled our family together and we started playing this clapping game. And that was just a funny game just to help everyone kind of lighten up and connect with each other and put some humor into what was a very strange and really stressful experience for everyone. So I'm gonna play for you a bit of the clapping game. Unfortunately, I don't have a visual record. I didn't do a video recording of it, but you can at least listen in and hear what the clapping game sounded like for our family. So dad's the beat, dad's the beat. Can I go first? That was dad not started purpose. It. That was not purpose. Movie stars. Like pizza. With? Anchovies. And mushrooms. Because they have fancy clothing. And they love dieting. Because they walk diabetes to perform these dances of Oscars. And sometimes when they are sleeping. Monsters will attack in their sleep. Therefore, sometimes they will perform miracles because of dragons and the ancient pope who, who was sometimes will attack monsters because popes are productive. Mesopotamia. <laughs> no pose being okay. attacking in the way. Okay. <laughs> okay. So that's a taste of the Staker family's clapping game. It really did help. And I felt like it was a turning point for this child and kind of for everyone emotionally as we learned to bond together and just have some humor as we went through what was a stressful experience. There's a similar phenomenon that affects all of our children right now. Across the country and really around the world, children are starved for more socialization. There has been a dramatic decrease in children's ability to just have routine, positive social experiences with each other and with adults. And it's leading to mental health problems. We say that glibly, but it's very true. There's data that supports it. The, there's a professor from the University of Sussex. Her name's Dr. Catherine Lester, and she measured what parents were observing about their children at the beginning of the pandemic. And she found that two thirds of parents perceived that their children were lonely. And compared to the previous year, that data reflected a 50% increase. Another professor from the UK, Maria Elizabeth Lodes, looked at more than 50 years worth of studies of the effects of quarantine on children. And what she found was that children and adolescents are more likely to experience depression and anxiety due to social isolation than adults are. And the really interesting thing to me was that she found that the duration of the loneliness is more strongly correlated with mental health symptoms than the intensity of the loneliness. So in other words, if children are lonely for a long period of time, that's even more detrimental to them than if they have a particularly severe moment of loneliness. And as the pandemic's dragged on and on, we've certainly um, 
put upon our children worldwide a burden of loneliness that's very unusual and that as the adults in this world today we absolutely have a responsibility to tune into and to try to rectify and so that's what i want to talk about today is what are concrete things that we can do as the adults in the lives of different children to help them socially and emotionally and one of the powerful things we can do that's relatively simple is to play games if you are familiar with the Clayton Christensen research on jobs to be done theory, you've heard folks at the Christensen Institute or myself talking several times about the idea that children don't have the job necessarily of education. What they feel innately prone to do in their lives, the job that they have is to have fun with friends and to feel like they're making progress every day. And they might hire education, they might hire a classroom to help them get that job done, but it's not innately in their wiring to want to just pursue education as much as they innately feel just wired to connect with friends and to have fun with friends. And so apart from children's social and emotional well-being, helping them connect with friends is an important strategy for then helping them want to show up and consume school. So if we lop off the social experiences or significantly truncate them because we put a screen in front of them and expect them to sit in Zoom in a soulless way with a screen dividing them from each other and without much interaction that's positive or fun, then we're expecting them to show up and consume something that they are not motivated innately to consume. And so it makes it the burden for teachers so much harder. Whereas if teachers take the time to blend the social experiences into their, their pedagogical approach, then the students are more likely, according to the theory, to want to show up and consume what's being taught. I'm going to play for you a vignette of a teacher named Miss Heidi who wanted to use games in her Zoom lessons more so that you can see what it looked like for her. But before I do that and talk a little bit about how to do this in a practical way, let me give you a couple of news flashes from Ready to Blend. The first is that March 30th, we're having a seminar called the, called the Rebooting Schools Seminar. It's a two-hour seminar, and the way it works is there's six mini classes that I'm teaching some of them, and then I have three other stellar uh, presenters who are teaching them, and they're about key topics right now for how do we reboot school as we're starting to somewhat see the light at the end of the tunnel from the pandemic? How do we think about assessing and addressing individual student needs? How do we blend a little bit of what we've learned this past year into our brick and mortar face-to-face -face classrooms again? How do teachers recover themselves and heal from what they've been through? So we'll be talking about those topics and more. It's March 30th from 3 to 5 p.m. Eastern time. So that's noon to 2 p.m. Pacific time. I'm in Central, so that'll be 2 to 4 p.m. my time. And the way it works is that we'll do a whole group meeting at the beginning of it, and then you'll choose from the six classes, each is 30 minutes long. So you'll rotate to the three classes of your choice, and then we'll meet up again at the end for a debrief. So I hope it'll be a really great way for you to just think about how do we reboot schools at this time. If you're interested in it, go to readytoblend.com forward slash events, and you can RSVP there. Tickets are $25 per participant. And again, you can just go to readytoblend.com forward slash events to purchase your ticket. Also, if you're interested in engaging with us even further, uh, we I have micro credentials that can help teachers certify that they're implementing blended learning practices into their classrooms. And so these are valuable skill sets that that teachers and school leaders can use to really one step at a time, think about how do we modernize our classrooms, whether they're online or face-to-face, -face, and really as online might be blending back into face-to-face. -face. So you can learn more about those at readytoblend.com forward slash micro-credentials. I have a series, I'm sorry, readytoblend.com forward slash micros. The page on what it, on the site is called micro credentials. It's a series of six micro credentials that help teachers earn a micro endorsement in blended learning in a way that's competency based and where you earn credit as you demonstrate that you're implementing these practices in your classroom. So those are two events that are happening right now through Ready to Blend that I want you to know about. So let's jump now to this video of Miss Heidi, who's using a game to help her students connect and have fun with each other before they launch into their independent and collaborative work as part of their blended learning arc. Take it away, Miss Heidi.
So the problem that I've been having with my Zoom classes, uh, it breaks my heart. These kids are not connecting. They were isolated. It was just disjointed. And um, I thought that team building uh, and opening up games, um, name games, and creating a fun environment with the first few minutes of class was going to be the solution to opening up their minds and their hearts to learning. And um, I want to show you some of the games that, that have worked for me and have been wonderful. These kids really came out of their shells and they're connecting with each other and they know each other's names because before they didn't. Hi, all you wonderful humans. The seven wonderful humans that I get to teach today. Now, remember yesterday when you decided, we decided together what the team building norm would be. That we would be better friends after the team building game than we were before. So each time we have a team building game, we're going to be better friends, right? So what, what does that look like? Yes, Reagan. We would all know each other's names and we would be more comfortable with each other. Ooh, that, I like what that sounds like. Yes, Raya. Um, basically the same thing as Reagan, but we'll just get along better and become better friends. Oh, I love that. That is perfect. We're going to do a name game. You're going to choose a word that either rhymes with your name or begins with the same letter or the same sound as your name. And we're going to act that word. For example, I could be Happy Heidi, or I could be Hysterical Heidi, something like that, right? So um, what I want to do is everybody will repeat the name in the same manner as the person did it. So that way we remember everybody, okay? So I'm going to do mm, hysterical Heidi. Everybody, one, two, three. Hysterical Heidi. Beautiful. I love that hysteria. Okay, who wants to go next? Let's go to Reagan, okay. Rainbow Reagan. One, two, three. Rainbow, Rainbow Reagan. I love it. Who's next? All right, Brooklyn. Uh, Book Brooklyn. Book Brooklyn. One, two, three. Book Brooklyn. Good job. Who's next? All right, Zane and then Vanessa. First Zane. Okay. Zany Zane. One, two, three. Zany Zane. Zane. Okay, can we remember everything starting with hysterical Heidi? Okay, this is to see if everybody's awake this morning. All right, we're going to try to do everybody in a row. One, two, three. Hysterical Heidi. Rainbow Reagan. Book Brooklyn. Zany Zane. Good job. Vicious Vanessa. Jumping Julia. Raya Papaya. Yay! Hello, my favorite learners. I see that you're all here. And we are going to begin with a team building game. But before we start the game, let's revisit the norm that you all decided on, right? Let's remember. We want to be better friends at the end of the game than we were before we started the game. Am I right? And what does that look like, Zane? It means to not tease each other. 
not tease each other. I, I like that. Yes, because sometimes teasing can hurt people's feelings, you know? So here we go. We have a wonderful team building game. It starts with once upon a time, and then you fill in the blank. There was a, raise your hand if you have an idea. All right, Julia was the first one. Once upon a time, there was a cement trampoline. A cement trampoline. I love it. My knees would not make it through that one. Okay, so once upon a time, there was a cement trampoline. Now we're going to decide what every day was. Every day, Reagan. Every day, the cement trampoline changed colors. Now we go to the next part of the story. But one day, something happened. Okay? Something happened to that trampoline. So, Ty, what happened? But well, one day, it turned into a golden color and bounced by itself. That is wonderful. Now we go to the next part of the story. Because of that, what happened? Zane. People were scared of the golden trampoline. And because of that, what happened? Raya? They tried to get rid of it. Until finally, something happened. Vanessa. Until buying trampolines became a trend. So the moral of the story is Brooklyn. Um, the moral of the story is to, uh, is think about like whether you want to do something or not. <laughs> Or else you don't become a golden trampoline and then trampolines are out on the market? Yeah. Okay. Yay! The fact that she wants us to be more connected as a class, not only as, as a class but as friends, it's really, it's really respectable and honorable. And, you know, I have to say I'm pretty happy with her progress. To me, it's very helpful that Miss Heidi has been starting doing these games because before, typically, I wouldn't, like, talk up as much. I had more about other kids um, say stuff, but with these games, I've been able to participate more, and I've felt more comfortable participating, and also, it's just more fun to be able to do these games. Um, it makes learning more fun and exciting. Um, so I really feel like this has just been super helpful with our learning and that we've gotten to know each other better and connected more, whereas before we were kind of like, you know, we didn't really know each other as well. So, yeah, I just feel like this has been helpful with our class. I love Miss Heidi's courage in trying something new with her online class and really slowing down to help her class members connect with each other and have some fun before they jumped into their work sprint. You might be thinking, but I don't have time in my busy classroom or in our busy family to slow down and play games. We just, we have so much that we need to get done. I really love the quote from Stephen Covey. Probably the thing that I remember the best from that book was when he talked about how with people, slow is fast. He said, Efficiency with people is ineffective. With people, fast is slow and slow is fast. And his, one of his vice presidents, Scott Miller from the Franklin Covey group, he said that he treats, sometimes he finds that he treats his relationships like toast. If you've been to one of those 
like three-star hotels that has the big industrial toasters and you put your bread in and it goes through like a conveyor belt to get toasted. And he said his tendency is to want to like crank it up to a nine so that it goes through the toaster really fast. But if you do that, then it gets burnt. And he uses that analogy to say that to make the best toast, you have to kind of let it go through that toaster at the right speed. And I think the same thing is true when it comes to people that taking the time to be slow with them actually is the most efficient way to lead them along in, in, the, in the growth path that we've identified with them, uh, with children, especially, maybe with spouses too. I think uh, I try and remind myself of that every weekend when it's time for a date night, that taking the time to do that does lead to a stronger relationship with my spouse. So how can we actualize this in a classroom? Kelly Kasuga was a ninth grade math teacher at Alpha Public Schools that I highlighted in the report, How to Create Higher Performing Happier Classrooms in Seven Moves, that I wrote for the Christensen Institute some time ago. I'll put it in the show notes today. And she wanted to shift to a flexible blended learning model. She was a face-to-face teacher and they'd been doing a station rotation and she found that she was constrained by having to stay in that guided group station. And so she wanted to shift to more of a flex model where all of the students in the classroom led their own learning or worked collaboratively with their peers to guide their learning. And that freed up her time to do one-on-one check-ins and small group instruction. What she found was that they would use, they would do a group meeting before launching into an independent or collaborative work sprint. And she felt like she needed something to connect her learners together during those group meetings. And so she started introducing games. So one example was she handed out fruit snacks to all of these ninth grade students and then had them, depending on the color of fruit snack that they got, they had to answer a question. So if they got a blue one, then they had to name three things about their family. Or if they got a red one, then they had to say, if they were uh, part of a hamburger, what part would they be? And one, one of the students said, I'd be the onion because people either love me or they hate me. But that was an example of what she did. And what, what she found over time was that those games that she did during her group discussions. And she also started taking a break in the middle of work sprints and just doing a game to kind of reconnect everyone to get the energy back up before they would pursue their work sprint again. She found that those games were lifesavers for helping those students feel connected to each other. It made the peer coaching work better. It made students want to be at school more. Remember the jobs to be done theory and this idea that students want to have fun with friends in the classroom. And so if we can structure the experience in a way that allows them to do that organically, then they're eager to show up and consume the lesson. Um, And so that was a real success for her. I'm also gonna put in the notes here, a link to a video called Morning Meetings and it highlights Highlander Charter School in Rhode Island. They use morning meetings also to connect the community. They last for about 15 minutes and they begin with a greeting where they greet each other and then share a bit and then they have an activity and then they review the schedule for the day. So it's a classic way of helping those learners connect with each other before they begin their work. As schools come back in person, consider a few ways that you might be able to build your community in your classroom. If your school is still fully remote, consider some ways that you might be able to add games into your remote experience for those learners. I will share several links to different activities that can work remotely or face-to-face or both so that you have access to those. If you're online, connect your community. If you're going back to school, connect your community. If you're in school as an ongoing practice, connect your community. I'm also going to link to a video of one of the many lip dubs that they do at Acton Academy, where for the first two weeks of school each year, they set aside time purely to connect the community. And you might think, how on earth do they afford, can they afford two whole weeks of instruction 
purely for game playing to connect to the community. But they found that if they don't do that, then their success is so limited because those learners benefit very much from knowing each other and feeling that loyalty to each other and learning how to work together and developing that kind of rapport and even that love for learning. So they do these lip dubs where the students themselves film each other recording parts of a song. And they're not actually singing the song, the, the musical artist is singing the song, but they perform it. And it's funny because they have one child holding the camera and in one take without cutting, they try to wind through the campus and film each collection of students singing their part of the lip dub. It's really funny. If you have time, Google Acton Academy lip dub, and you'll see examples of these from all over the world, but I'll, I'll post one of them in the show notes. It's such a beautiful way of connecting the community. And then apart from whatever you might do at the start of a session to form the team, there's the ongoing maintenance. And this is what I really value in my family, uh, it, that ongoing maintenance that we experience as we play games together and just pause to have that fun with each other. It's the ongoing maintenance that helps a classroom. There was a student named Ricky, who I used to teach, who really struggled to participate. And it, he was the classic child who you might say had behavior problems. And one day I just went to his home and met him there and hung out with him and his family for a while. And it really improved our relationship. So connecting as individuals with each other, showing that we're friends is such an important way to then develop that foundation to be able to move forward. Our children need us as adults right now to bring some of the socializing and humanity back into our classrooms. I'm so fascinated by the research that shows that adults, that school leaders say that social emotional learning is one of their key objectives for the 2021 school year. And I'm not surprised. So there's research from Chelsea Waite at the Christensen Institute where she looked at over a hundred schools that are innovative schools and she asked them to tag what they're working on right now. And the number one tag was social and emotional learning. We know that our children need that connection right now. And we know that they're starved for it. And we know that we're going to pay a price if we don't do it. And just that the day-to-day -day life for ourselves is more miserable as, as the children show up anxious and irritable and not wanting to engage. And so I wanna recommend to you that we take the time in the weeks ahead to play some games and to help them connect with us and with the community in a way that brings some joy back into their lives and helps them heal socially and emotionally without even learning about social emotional learning. They can just in fact be more social in the classroom and that leads to the results that we want for them with their, with their um, level of happiness and wanting to be in school. So bottom line, if you're online right now, connect your community. If you're in person or starting to go back in person, plan for those first per periods of time together to be full of connecting your community using games. And if you've been in class, if you've been in face-to-face -face class, Make it an ongoing practice to every day and every session, spend some time connecting your community. Again, I will post some resources for you along with this show to give you suggestions on how to move forward with specific games. So links to games that can work online and in person that I hope you'll use and find, bring some joy and laughter back in the lives of our children. Farm animals are hungry. Chickens. Because they smell like hay. And sometimes they will sell other chickens to like to maintenance. Oh. oh.